over the next five to ten years. Uh, well, brace yourself. One of the industries that will go sky high for the wrong reasons is uh, security. But most of the major growth in the five to ten years out are likely to be in industries that don't currently exist. Keep in mind that during your duration of students, or as students at the University of the District of Columbia, by the time you have entered your last two years, almost all knowledge you have been taught prior to that uh, is bordering on obsolete. Except for this bordering class. Obsolete. Now, that means, folks, you're looking for industries that don't currently exist. Dealing with technologies or using the technologies that have just barely come to the surface. Uh, the obsolescence curve now is so great that corporations deemed to be bulletproof for 50 years are ceasing to exist. The most recent for all practical purposes is Kodak. Question two. Well, let me go back to question one. It's not so much the industries that will exist as it is highly flexible minds. The greatest struggle we now have anywhere, anywhere on the planet, has to do with access to human minds more than it has to do with access to goods, services, and even raw materials. Access to human minds is absolutely critical regardless of the shell in which those minds are wrapped. Uh, everything from uh, gender, ethnicity, race, most of these things are not going to determine what becomes successful. It is how an institution, organization, small group can access the potential minds. Because, ladies and gentlemen, we do not compete against countries. We don't compete against companies. We don't even compete against regions around the world. We are now competing against whole hegemonous cultures. And this is increasing because the planet is very small. So when you look at that, you need to be amazingly flexible, not to mention resilient, quick on your feet, and able to think across cultures is going to drive the application of industries more than the industries themselves. Okay, got that? Second point, you asked, what impact do you think public and private unions have had on modern day organizations in the United States? Uh, that's a good question and a very tough one to answer. Tough because the creation of unions is historical. Unions did not exist until vast abuses of labor became the norm in American business or the capitalist structure. Unions were created to protect workers more than advance them. Now we have a system where in the public sector, the deal struck with people after the, first, after the Second World War was that you work for the public good, you get less money, you don't make all the big bucks, but in return for that, being a school teacher, public worker, uh, we sort of guarantee your retirement. We guarantee that you don't have to worry past a certain point. On the last uh, 15 years, uh, lots of people have attempted to throw the unions under the bus and ignore the fact that, that these public unions grew out of a social contract. Now, I don't know how that's going to play out. Uh, you have out in Wisconsin the recall of the governor going on, and that's likely to happen. Uh, you have people in other states around the world, other, uh, the country, beginning to rethink their initial criticisms of unions. So the public sector unions, the health care unions, very much the teachers' unions. Yet unions are still human institutions. They have the same foibles as any other large institution, such as a corporation. Uh, and that's you can become stuck in your ways. You can absolutely believe that you're right. And that's the death bell for most, most organizations in this world. Once you believe you are right, uh, you stop listening. 
So unions have the same problem as any other large corporation. In the private sector, unions grew very powerful, very strong, became organizations unto themselves, and then by the late 70s and the early 80s, mergers, acquisitions, and divestitures, and straightening of companies became the norm. To go in, buy up a big company, uh, the company had a company union, well-funded, swap out the cash held by the company unions in exchange for company stock, which quickly became worthless. Breaching what had grown up in the 40s, 50s, and 60s as the contract between workers in a company and the company itself. Uh, you all have read the news in different stages where companies go in and fire all the long-term employees and bring in um, lower wage employees who are trying to get started, as such as yourselves, or trying to get promoted. Well, that's a problem. You wind up with a very knowledgeable senior workforce. Very knowledgeable. Lots of experience. Underemployed. Dipping into savings prematurely. Bagging groceries at the local um, Safeway. And they show up as full employment when that could not be further from the truth. So, when you are thinking about policies of public and private sector, you have to consider that this is not a yes or no situation. This is deeply interlaced with the health of the total community. The health of the total community. It cannot be isolated. Cultures fall anywhere in the world where they begin to isolate their own populations. Figure out we don't have to serve this population or we don't have to serve that population because it's not convenient and we can't afford it. If you go back any, anywhere into history, go back to Rome several thousand years ago, fourth century Rome, you'll find the same logic and you will find the culture dissolves. It cannot sustain. So, the third question raised, let's see, and to produce these things, which is one of the reasons iPad is made in China. Uh, you will never make an iPad in the United States. That's, that can't happen. You don't have the, uh, the rare earths to do it. You don't have the scarce minerals to do it. Something else has to happen. We have to reinvest rather than extract cash out of the system. An example of where we've missed the boat, um, Widescreen TV, to take something very simple like the widescreen you either have in your home or the one you've been drooling over that your spouse will not let you buy. Very interesting machine. It's a full board, it's a motherboard, very big motherboard. The clarity of the screen is a specific kind of technology that was invented in the United States and controlled by the United States, Motorola, Zenith, the Black Matrix. Only the companies at that time in the 80s did not want to invest in manufacturing to build them, so they were bought up by the Koreans now, and the Chinese. Now the best television on the market is Samsung. The patents are owned by Korea. It's manufactured. The mid-range sets, the most popular sets, are manufactured in Mexico, according to the specs written by Samsung. This market was totally owned by the United States. It chose not to reinvest. That's an issue. I, we don't have quick solutions. If you want to expand jobs here, you have to not just create work. You now have to create whole new industries, most of which do not now exist. you to move, to afford to move, to be retrained, and then it moves your families. In the United States, we don't do that. Seven regions in the country, and we have yet to come to grips with that. So we have wasted minds all over the place. All over the place. We have bloated welfare systems, not because people don't want to work, but what will you do with your family? How will you get retrained? How will you go on a hunting expedition if you've got to move from Massachusetts to California? 
how will both you and your and family at home be cared for? Why did you attempt to do that? That is a real national policy. Uh, we don't have it. It puts us at a massive disadvantage when dealing with any other foreign government and foreign country against whom we presently compete. I'm moving too fast. Just holler, slow down, wave your hands or something, okay? Business policy, question four. Business policy encompasses different forms of policies and strategy analogies. Yep. Could you please explain certain strategies that could lead to black swans in the context of business policy? Ah, uh, my, my, my. Okay. Yell out on this one. How many of you are familiar with what a black swan is? Okay, good. An event, no matter how improbable, if it occurs, the effects are calamitous. I will give you one primary example of a recurring black swan. Tsunamis. Three years ago, Indonesia got inundated with one. Three and a half years ago. Two and a half years ago, Chile got nailed with one of these. There were subsequent small major wave fronts all over the Pacific Rim, primarily on the Western Rim. And then 15 months ago, Japan got hit with a massive 8.7 and a double seismic wave, extremely rare and put a 30-foot wall of water 25 miles inland, decimating the northern port assembly and shipping city of Sendai. That is a black swan. The big issue, the big problem with them is when you have businesses interrelated, global businesses, when you are dependent on parts coming through Sendai from various other Asian countries and then transshipped to South America and Australia for milling, refining, and assembly, and then shipped from there all over the world. If you take out a port city, you haven't just hit Japan. You have hit immediately 1,600 other companies broadside. They cannot function. They grind to a halt. And they do so out of 23 countries. What we are now facing is when a black swan occurs, it does not just hit a country or a city. It hits the total commerce grid worldwide. And with an increase in population, the impact of black swans is increasing in its cost. And the number of black swans are increasing. That is a new phenomenon of the last 20 years. The number of black swans due to nature are increasing. Well, what's this do with policy? If you're running a company, your biggest problem is closing the sales books at the end of the week of the month. You know, you don't have time to really think about what in the world do I do if uh, I lose a vendor in Sendai or some other calamity goes on with volcanoes and takes us out. You don't have time to do that. Now, if you're running a very large company with Global Net, you don't have the luxury of not dealing with the concept of risk. When I was being trained, and um, it wasn't as far ago as dinosaurs walking the earth, but the tar pits weren't full yet. When I was being trained, you could still deal with these things. Not now. You have to have a very different view of what constitutes risk. If you are a corporate manager, if you are an upper level business manager, even if you are a hospital manager, because your supplies are coming from all over the world. Black swans becomes a component of risk thinking. It used to be a, um, and we'll only go back 25 years, it used to be that a revolution within a country would constitute a black swan. Not now. 
There are 14 active revolutions going on all around the country of the world. Active revolutions. The most visual, if you will, is Syria. Yet in Libya uh, and Egypt are still within a phase of internal conflict. Different than uh, Syria, but still within the phase. So what you now have is when one of these things goes on, there's usually other countries that wind up involved in one way or another, even if it's only by religion or ideology. You're planning a business. You want global trade. You want global traffic. What you now have to understand are the sensitivities in multiple regions. That's a new ball game. Yet the people that are able to do this well get paid very, very well. Treat that as a clue. It requires, as a manager, a working person, you have to think in several dimensions at once. Not just the dimension of your professional discipline. You have to think in terms of how you interact with the world and how the world interacts with you because the opportunities are increasing. If you look at the issue of food, we have a planet that is uh, extremely hungry, huge sections of it starving, and there's only a couple of places on Earth that have more than one growing season. Parts of the United States have three growing seasons a year. We should be in the business of feeding the world not in the business of subsidizing crop production for corporate farms. We have the capacity to actually feed a good half the planet outright if we were organized to do it, and do it at profit. But policies tend to be too short term. Corporations aren't going to entertain three to five quarters of low profits. Politicians uh, who receive donations aren't going to pass any laws that restrict or seem to limit the ability of companies to make short-term profits quarter to quarter. Well, in terms of history, that logic does not work. It is one of the things that helps to collapse whole societies. So, well, we're struggling with that one. Ah, uh, fifth. What is your take on the University of the District of Columbia and the direction in which it is headed? Uh, can I plead the fifth on that? <laughs> I'm not there, so it, it's, a, it's a little hard to do. But, so let me back up the question. While you're trying to assess life at UDC, and I, I've seen some of the student presentations, if you will. They looked a lot like uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. Uh, people, uh, students sailing into Building 39 with cutlasses between their teeth. I don't advise you do this. <laughs> Understand that all of higher education is under fire. Under fire. It is an open strategy. Some very large uh, uh, schools, they start with Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt's moving in this direction, to eliminate the four-year degree. Teach it in three years, period. Cut the cost. Keep the courses more relevant to the immediate here and now and the future, and have it concentrated to include the summer. Three years you're out at the relative same dollars but not the dollars of a four-year course. I see nothing that is going to stop this advance. The master's degree, which used to be the, your top line, is now only your certification that says you're capable of learning. That used to be the bachelor's degree. So what happens to the students that you serve? How do you best do that? when this whole process is in transition. Now UBC most assuredly faces that, but I have to tell you, every other institution with, with whom I'm directly familiar, 
advised Bentley University, George Washington uh, College in Maryland, and um, as it turns out, I thought I was going to be you know, left alone in my study here, a nice fireplace, but I wind up at the University of Memphis, uh, the business school, and advising them on strategic issues relative to business people who are now active in what the business school produces. Notice, they have a highly active business advisory board at the Fogelman College. As a matter of fact, they've got four of these. One dealing with marketing and supply chain, one dealing with the Wilson School of um, Hospitality and Resort Management, one dealing with the business school itself, and another dealing with the School of Accountancy. And these folks are basically local, within a hundred miles of, of Memphis, and they are very, very local. They spell out in great detail, just last week we had one of these sessions from the School of Accountancy, what they think education has to produce that they will hire. And who are they hiring now, and why are they hiring them? They are demanding a certain kind of product come out well-oriented to how the world is shifting. And they are showing up with, uh, if you do this in your curricula correctly, we will provide more internships. Well, the students heard that before the faculty did. More internships, money, pay the tuition. What do we have to do? The faculty, fortunately, has been dealing with trying to, how, trying to figure out how you migrate into this new demand structure. And in the middle of that, we find one of our top competitors, Vanderbilt University's Owen School of Business, has dramatically increased its online partial residency, professional MBA program, and expanded the geography. Uh, we found this out three weeks ago. They announced it. We did not receive this news well, but it was not a surprise. We promptly uh, dropped some of the strategic plans because uh, you don't pursue a strategic plan that has now been made obsolete by a very wealthy, powerful, private institution. New Memphis is public, its resources are limited, but its customer service sits at the top. So, it's under that total environment that I would say you have to understand what UDC struggles under. But most of all, you have to determine what it is you really want to learn. The responsibility as uh, shifting to the student desk at a much faster speed. And it requires students not to uh, get too upset about the interim actions because UBC, like any other university or college, is temporary in your life. Temporary. Once you are gone and racing down that street to downtown, racing out, uh, you have to remember to come back and get your cars or you'll leave the place so fast. It is very transitory in your life, in your perspective. You have to figure out what will you leave there that will help the students that follow, what needs to be improved, what do you need to articulate very strongly about your experience and your ability to become gainfully employed or to increase employment. Now, I was teaching uh, there several years ago, corporate strategy and, and policy. Uh, all students hated me. It was really amazing the first uh, half of the, the semester. I said, dude, my, my modus operandi is, is uh, I have, I'm, out of, I'm out of a North, couple of Northeast schools. I teach ruthlessly, I work to death, but I will get you promoted. And in the first, um, I'll avoid most of these little war stories, but this one's important. In the, in the first class, they were boycotting, about to boycott, complained to Dr. McClue quite vocally, and then one lady came in midway, interrupted the whole class, ran to her girlfriends, and then broke into this animated discussion, and the, and the class looked at me and thought there was going to be blood on the sands, and once her girlfriends got her calmed down, and she realized she had started talking, and they asked, I asked, well, what happened? And she apologized up and down, but she had taken some of the analysis techniques we were dealing with, there was a department 
overhaul, a big one, a reorganization. The lead uh, manager came up with a design. She sketched out her own SWOT analysis and then went to her boss and said, this isn't going to work. They have omitted several key problems. Her boss, a supervisor, then took this young lady to the manager and they both said, this isn't going to work. The manager said, you're, you're right, we forgot some things. So during the course of the work day, they made a re they changed and corrected according to the shortfalls this young lady had identified. They also uh, had designed in a new supervisor position, and they all unanimously agreed she should have the new supervisor's position. So in the course of one day, following the things we said, she absolutely had to learn to succeed in the business world, the kinds of people I used to hire as a CFO, she had gotten a 15% raise and guaranteed another 22% in, in uh, something like 11 months. So she, of course, cartwheeled in the class and had no sense that I was actually teaching at that particular time because this immediately translated to money, which translated to family, which translated to opportunity, which translated to motion. At that point, I went from being the worst possible faculty member in the views of the seniors to one that might possibly survive and be useful. Okay. The decision to apply what she learned to the workplace got her promoted, not me. The decision to actually take it seriously walk out of the class every day and say, all right, he's crazy, but how do I get promoted? How do I apply it? That's a conscious decision you make in your head. If you can grasp that, whatever UBC does in the short term, while it may not thrill you to death all, at all times, uh, you're going to be pretty content with it. And then when you give feedback, evaluation, you get to say, this is what I learned, but this is what I need to learn. This is what we need to be taught. And it makes a major difference. Is it wise to raise tuition at a university when it currently has a hard time in maintaining enrollment? That's a tough one. And it's tough because you know, the is it wise is sort of a trap. And anything that says get more of your money is going to be immediately viewed as unwise. The sad reality is what it takes to teach is increasing much faster than the resources available to public institutions. Much, much faster. There, the, the, the gorilla in, in, in the room is the university of Maryland, which endowed, literally a state school which endowed university college separate from the budget of the university itself, which let them run riot with online programs and do all kinds of things. Of course, you have a whole state with a lot of industries sitting there and a high demand for industrial trained people, and then they, here we are at UDC with a city, uh, the land, 62% of the land is owned by things that cannot be taxed. Big problem. You have to figure out where does the fund, where do the funds come from? How do you do this in order just to function? How do you do it? So, is it wise? Wise is not the operative word. Is it hard? It's very, very hard. Very hard. At the University of Memphis, they had, uh, before I arrived, they had gone through three straight years of budget cuts. At the same time, the evil monsters at Vanderbilt University in Nashville were industriously figuring out how to expand their territory and pumping money into the business school. The end result is the university has to raise its um, tuition rates. Not that it wants to, but that it has to compete. It has to provide the resources for education. Everything in its, its, its uh, higher level MBA programs include very nice laptops uh, because not only do the people work on these laptops, they interface with their companies back wherever they're from. And their sponsoring companies are FedEx, International Paper, the huge medical complexes, um, 
the huge uh, medical device companies down here, uh, they will not accept a student that does not have, they won't fund a student that does not have amazing technological access that requires the, the Ogleman to maintain a very sophisticated systems technical, a technical support systems operation in its own building. Wow. It's a big ticket number. So, it's really hard. It's very, very hard. Now, the only way you can justify that if you're the person paying is if you fully understand what that degree and what you are learning is worth to you as you increase your marketability and your own abilities to provide for either existing families or those which you uh, hope to provide for. You have to reduce this decision to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Food, clothing, shelter, sustenance, and does this help you do this? If the answer is yes, move forward. Do not get tied up in a short-term financial decision. Move forward. Seven, how do policies fluctuate in their application from one person to another? I can't begin to answer that because every single person is different. Every one of you sitting there is a different set of objectives, similar sets of needs, but very different paths. Policies depend upon who's making the policy. Federal policy, understand a problem in the United States. You listen to the rhetoric from the political state all the time. The Republicans got through bashing each other better than any Democrat on life ever thought of bashing them, and they did so for five bloody brutal months uh, under the guise of differing policies. Folks, the United States has 50 states. Under the structure of this Constitution, each state has more power than any district, borough, unit, of any country in Europe, China, Asia, Africa. It is quasi-sovereign. The problem you get with 50 of these little critters running around is it requires a very substantial federal system just to hold reins and figure out how to keep it steered. If you read the, con the Constitution of the United States carefully, if you read the Federalist Papers, well, you don't have time to do that. So you read the anti-Federalist Federalist Papers. But if you read the Constitution, and if you look at the map of the original 13 states, nobody who wrote the Constitution in their wildest nightmares envisioned 50 of these. No one. Yet that's what we manage. That's what the country manages. So when you get into issues of policy, Cut 50 states up so you have seven regions, and then try and add a federal government. And you're trying to figure out what policy, when you write one policy, who is who does it affect? And it's usually very few people. It means everybody else is left out in the breeze until someone writes another policy. So when people ask this question, ask me this question, I say, you have to stand back from that question. You have to understand what the country is and what it is not. You have to really understand that the short-term orientation of business and the short-term orientation of politics, a two-year election, the House of Representatives never stops running for office, always fundraising. That is not in any way how you take care of the business of the country. But that's how this has evolved. Um, Senators, you're in Washington. You need to see or go and put, put your eyeballs on the Senate chamber. It is shockingly small. It's very tiny. It's not what you think when you look at the Capitol from outside. It's a little bitty, tiny room uh, of which all these things take place, and they're always running for money and have political ideologies on either side of the aisle, Democrat or Republican, doesn't matter. This means that for the most part, you now have 
an inability in the political estate to actually develop cohesive, long-term policies. Yes, so short-term oriented. This may sound like terrible bad news, but you kind of you are, you already figured this out when you watch the evening news from time to time. You have to think about what you want to do and what you want to be. This responsibility, there is a reason that when the Constitution was signed, only one in 15 people could vote. And most people have this delusion about everybody ran to the polls right after the Constitution was written. Oh, no, 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 no. Not the design. You had to be educated and you had to own property. The uniqueness of the United States was you could own a third of an acre of land, one cow, half a barn, and a crop to grow vegetables on, and you had the right to vote. The same single right as if you had a huge farm or a big plantation house, the single right to vote made the United States one of the most interesting experiences or experiments ever in governance. But we don't teach that, so lots of people don't understand it. You need to understand what the country is and that your polit politicians cannot respond in the short term. Heck, between the time of the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights, by the time all the documents were signed, it was 13 years. 13 years. Lots and lots of review, battles over the language, figuring out who was going to be affected and how. The last big bill that got passed, Dodd-Frank, was written on the job bill, horrible language, health care, even worse. These are written in three to four months. I just need you to reflect on that. <laughs> you can't do it. But we, we try anyway. So, why we don't have a national labor po uh, policy? Same problem. Why you don't have a uniform education policy? Same problem. We're never designed to. We're designed to be massively checks and balances, but nobody envisions short-term decision-making. Which leads you to the other question, do companies change policies to accommodate strategy or change strategies to accommodate policies? Ah, now if you are a CFO, anybody out there want to be a CFO? One hand I see, two, uh, don't do it. I, I did that for 12 years, it silvers your hair, it, it, it's an exhausting, uh, it will just kill you, it just drive you to an early grade, there'll be reasons why you don't own guns if you become a CFO. <laughs> that being said, you do want to own your own company. You really do. Once upon a time, you go to work for, you work for three companies in your entire career on average, and many work for only one or two. Now the number's up to 15. The ability to retire and flush down the toilet, the likelihood of staying with a company long enough uh, to have something called job security, because you're always wondering who's going to come in and buy the company and fire you. We're going to make big savings, uh, empty out Mabel's desk and tell her when she gets back from lunch that she's not employed and we'll make the, the quarterly numbers. That means the security that once existed does not exist. What does exist is a desperate need for innovation. Absolutely desperate need for people who know how to make decisions. People who are willing to know how to manage. That need is skyrocketing. It is all over the world. Uh, if you know, I had no intention of ever running an institute full time. I had no intention of being a freelance person. I thought getting a job would be absolutely remarkable under any circumstance, especially coming out of the 60s, dealing with the early 70s. It didn't turn out that way. If you want to make an impact, build something, anything. Yes, it's going to take a lot of work, and yes, it's going to be all kinds of sleepless nights, but the issue of which comes first, you know, the chicken or the egg, Companies changing policies for strategy. Or strate strategy used to be a long-term thing. But in the velocity of change, you can't have a five-year strategy. You are lucky if you have a three-year strategy because everything in your environment, everything in your environment will have changed. 
all it takes is, I mean, in Japan, or another major war, or another major outbreak, and the immediate marketing changes. Piracy disrupted all three different industries, and it did so for eight years uninterrupted. So what used to be strategy is now very different. What is markedly improved is if you have a strategy for yourself, you can apply it to most opportunities. Does it fit what you want to do? Does it take you where you really want to go? And you have to think about that a little more than normal, a little more than what used to be the, the, the average process. And then you have to look at who you work for. Do you trust them? Used to be, back when dinosaurs were heading to the tar pits, it didn't matter. Man, there's only so much damage a boss could do before you, you let all the air out of his or her tires and they begin to get the message that this wasn't going to work for them. <laughs> Not the kicks now. The velocity of change is too great. It is moving too fast. You have to be on top of that and then you determine can you trust the people with whom you work can you trust the bosses to tell you at least what they believe to be true? If that answer is no, Hit the road. get out. Now don't run out tomorrow and not pay the rent in the market. No, no, no. But you need a new plan. The same holds true if you want to succeed to the people that work for you absolutely trust you. Because everybody arrives at work Sergey, I think I'm off the script here, but everybody arrives at work. If you're a manager or a supervisor now, you've got a lot of people showing up to work. By the time they get there, by the time they walk in the door, let's pick 8.30, they are worried about health care, they are worried about a sick child, they are worried about food, gas, mortgage, how to pay another raft of bills, the car's not running right, there are three stop signs, the police are at the door, and I got out the back door. They arrive loaded with anxieties. Loaded. That's 8.30. That's your workforce. That's all y'all. <laughs> You've got 20 minutes to get them into trace and marching in a single formation. You've got 20 minutes. If you cannot lead them in, that, in a single direction productively, you have not only major problems, because you can't get them in 20 minutes. It'll be 10 o'clock before people start to focus. That's coffee break. Daryl, we have about five minutes left, I think, because I need to, or maybe about three. So maybe one more question. Let me ask if anybody wants to actually come up and ask a question in person. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Uh, last question, and uh, who would that be? Well, I'm sorry? Okay, one more question. <coughs> Hi, Professor. My name is uh, Junior Singh. And yes. I just have a very quick question about welfare. Um, what do you think about the welfare reform and the impact on the, ne uh, on the nation and the economy? And do you think it's, bi um, it's a viable reform system when you factor in the gap between the rich and the poor? Okay. High level, high level answer first. There is no time in the last 5,000 years that any society with this gap between in income inequality has ever survived. They, they have not. You cannot sustain society where wealth is not constantly reinvested. So we don't even get to the welfare level. We don't even get to that policy. We haven't figured out a central will to reinvest. There's a vast difference between making a million dollars and putting in gold bars in the cellar versus producing nuts and bolts and nails and hammers and absolutely building something. There is an economic difference between the two. The last 25 years, Wealth has been aggregated to trading of paper. By definition, that does not create jobs and does not create work. By definition. That may not be really joyful news, but 
this is a will, not a matter of policy. We don't have the political will. Got the question now? Professor Poole, thank you very much. Unfortunately, yeah, thank you. Much appreciated. Be well. Thank you so much, and uh, God bless. Oh, same to you. Thanks, Doc.